Lewis Riddick of the Mothership, former NFL safety and uh, former front office person. He joins us on the program. All right. Worst loss of the weekend in the NFL was turned in by who? Oh, man. I'll probably say um, I'll probably say either Buffalo or Pittsburgh. Um, Buffalo because of – and Sean admitted it after the game was over about how he handled the end-of-game situation there, coming out from his own end zone, backed up uh, before – instead of just playing for going into overtime, understanding that Houston had such a big kicker, a kicker with such a big leg. Should he have just kind of like forced them to use their timeouts, eat up the clock, you know, throwing the ball three straight times. That That's huge. That's huge for them. For Pittsburgh, I mean, it's it's tough having them in a situation where you come that close down there on the goal line to knocking the ball out of Landon Roberts, making one of the coolest plays you'll see, and then them not able to recover the football then Jalen Tolbert coming back from getting hit in the mm-hmm. area that no one wants to get hit and then make one of the greatest, you know, one of the, a, a big time catch. Let's just put it that way. A big, big, big time catch. I mean, that's huge. That's just a gut punch for them. I'm hoping that the team doesn't overreact and like all of a sudden start like you, you can already sense that, you know, I know on the broadcast that people were thinking, well, look, this is the end of the Justin Fields era. It's going to be Russell Wilson's show now. And people start kind of like focusing their attention in the wrong places because Pittsburgh needs wide receiver help. They just do. And you saw that a little bit last night. But I think those two losses in particular, they they really stick out to me, you know, yesterday. Um, there's others. The Jets game is a huge one, too. Everyone will want, want to talk about the Jets all the time <clears throat> because of, um, you know, just the people's affinity for when to talk about them. But I think the B- Buffalo and Pittsburgh, yeah, they stand out the most. All right. Josh Allen goes nine for 30. Yeah. Uh, he got his bell rung mm-hmm. and went right back in the game. Yep. <sighs> Nothing changes in the NFL. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, it, it obviously, Dan, and I, and I know what you're alluding to. It, it just makes you believe that, you know, that sometimes, or makes you wonder if sometimes, the protocol is not followed to a T uniformly, regardless of the game situation, the individual involved, all that. And and you don't ever want to accuse anybody of not doing that because we understand that player health uh, is something that has been at the forefront of our discussion for years now, especially concerning concussion health. But yeah, when you see him whack his head on the ground like that and you're sitting there playing the amateur doctor, you know, from your couch and you're watching it and you're looking at his body language and you're sitting there going, man, he doesn't look quite right. He leaves, he goes in, he comes right back, right back out and he's right back on the football field in one play, he misses one play. Yeah, it makes you start going, come on now. But I mean, what else are you going to do if you don't trust the medical professionals, if you don't trust the system that's put into place to, to take care of the players? I mean, who else can you trust? So, yeah, where do you go from there? All right, uh, some other games. You know, I'm watching the Ravens and the Bengals, and mm-hmm. um, that felt like whoever had the ball last was going to win that game. Yeah, for sure. The the quarterbacks, I mean, that that's about as good as Joe Burrow really can play. And I know anyone now who wants to hang the loss on Joe around Joe Burrow's neck and say, look, he's still not playing good enough that that's what franchise quarterbacks are supposed to do. They're supposed to elevate their football. Look, Joe Burrow can't do crap about Lamar Jackson fumbling the ball, picking it up, stiff arming Sam Hubbard and jumping it up in the air before he goes out of bounds and throwing it across his body and throwing it. To- There's nothing you can do about that. And Derrick Henry's just a freak. We knew this long before he got to Baltimore. But for him to just kind of like have the kind of runs that he has at the times that he has them, like he did yesterday. Look, Baltimore, Baltimore, as they're finding their way defensively with Zach Orr running the show now, offensively, they're looking like a football team that when they're locked in and they have everything dialed in, they're going to be tough to deal with, man. They really are. And for Cincy, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know how they fix the defense. I don't know what the issue is. And I love Lou Anarumo. I love him more than anybody in the NFL. I believe he's deserved to be a head coach for a while now. But man, the defense is just not able to just consistently make the plays and the stops that they need to make. And that's why they're sitting where they are. What 
Can you remember a running back trying to tackle a running back similar to Derrick Henry when you were playing? No. There's only one guy who I remember being like that, that tall, that long. There was a guy who played for, he played for Denver. I believe he played for the Chargers before that name, Rod Bernstein, who wound up, who was an H-back tight end type that they wound up putting that running back when he was in Denver. And I remember it was 93 or 94 when I was in Cleveland and Denver came to Cleveland. And I remember sitting there looking at this guy going, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is a tight end playing tailback. And that's really what Derek is. And those guys, like, I don't care who you are. Those guys will make you make business decisions if you're not wired right. So how can you pretend to tackle somebody? Like it, it is a business decision, but you, you don't want to be like, man, that guy's soft. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you do? Dion used to call it when we were in Atlanta, man. He used to call it low five in a guy. Instead of high five him, put your head, he said, that's when you go down by his ankles and you <laughs> five him by the ankles. And you made it, you make it look like an honest effort to trip him up. But really what you're saying is, look, I'm not putting my face in there. If somebody hadn't seen the Vikings play, how would you describe them? If someone hadn't seen the Vikings play? Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I would say I would... On offense, I would say, look, this is a team that's probably being being coached offensively as good as any team in the NFL right now, given how Sam Darnold has been able to keep them on a track right now that I don't think anybody thought that they, he'd be able to keep them on. But Kevin O'Connell is, is right now, he's leading the pack as far as coach of the year for me. So I think there you'd be like, you're going to see supreme play calling and coaching and game managing on the offensive side and defensively. It is 60 minutes of absolute fury that you will see 11 guys up on the line of scrimmage and you don't know which 11 are coming. And they are, and he, and Brian Flores right now is absolutely just causing some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL fits, nightmares. Cause he's telling you, I'm going to hit you. And I'm going to try and hit you before you can figure out where that free runner is going to come from and you can get the ball out. Okay, but why haven't other coaches done this? Why is what Brian Flores is doing different than anybody else? Oh, I think it's because, look, it always comes with risk. There can always be consequences. I don't know if every coach from a play calling perspective understands how to get those free runners on quarterbacks meaning how to attack protections understands protections as well as maybe he does and he was he was taught by the very best in new england and so not everybody is as confident and as comfortable doing the things that he does because it does come with risk and some coaches are like no nah, i'm not i'm not willing to do that i'm not willing to put myself in harm's way like that but he has made a he has made a career out of it he made a career out of it all the way to being a head coach and i think you know all things being equal, he may get another shot at it if his football team on this side of the ball can keep playing like they're playing. Lewis Riddick in the Mothership, ESPN NFL College Football Analyst. Uh, he was on the call with SMU and Louisville. You got the Monday night uh, game with, with the Chiefs and the Saints. Mm -hmm. Kansas City hasn't been good offensively. Uh, mm -hmm. No Rice. Travis Kelsey is hit or miss. Mm -hmm. You lose Pacheco. They are a defensive team first. They've been that the last two years. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's it's funny. Look, you have the the ultimate equalizer in Patrick, obviously, who can, when he needs to, do exactly what he needs to in terms of getting a role player to make a big play. Noah Gray last week in 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 LA with the Chargers with a with a big completion over the middle. Samaj P. Ryan. You know, it's Kareem Hunt coming back into the folds. Xavier Worthy just splitting double teams, and Patrick puts it on him. But there's no question that that Steve Spagnuolo is probably the most valuable assistant in the NFL right now, given what the expectations are in Kansas City every week. And Chris Jones is probably the most impactful, needs to be the most impactful player on the defensive side of the football for a team that has the kind of expectations that Kansas City does. And he delivers, Dan, over and over again. When they need him, Chris Jones is the guy who's either pressuring the passer, sacking the passer, getting some kind of big TFL tackle for a lot. He does it over and over. If it wasn't for Aaron Donald, him playing in the same era, 
Chris may be, you know, as far as interior players, considered one of the best we've ever seen. If it wasn't for the fact that he was playing at the same time that Aaron Donald, who mm-hmm. is the best that we probably has, have ever seen. I'm going to put you in the front office with the Cleveland Browns. What are you doing <laughs> with your quarterback? <laughs> you mean like, what am I doing if I didn't have to answer to the owner? Um, sure. Put, yeah. I'm putting them on the bench because I'm sure the coach is probably in my office going, when can I put him on the bench because he doesn't give us the best chance to win? When can I make a change here because he's not giving us the best chance to win? When can I make a change here because I can't run the offense I want to run because he's not the guy to run the offense I want to run. So I, I'm sure I would be having that conversation going, okay, look, we understand. We understand what you're saying. Um, and if I had the autonomy to make that decision, I would understand that I would support the coach, but they are in a situation where this is then this is the single, like, and this isn't hyperbole either. This is the single worst contract and situation. Maybe like, like, I mean, I'd have to really sit here and think about it you know, a little bit more, but I can't think of a single worse contract situation in the history of sports. Think about that. I mean, at least Tua plays well when he's in there. I never would have signed him to an extension, given the medical right. risk. But yep. Watson just doesn't play well. It, it's like that, he's he's vacant when he's out there. That, he's, that's it. He's checked out. This is every, like, like Tua... I mean, I get it. I get the risk, you know, that that they were taken down there in Miami, given his medical history. But it's it's everything that came with Deshaun that they knew of before they even signed him. And now on top of it, like the crap play that he's putting out there right now is just like the icing on the whole crap cake. It's just awful. The whole thing is awful. And I'm telling you. Like, like it's one of those situations where you sit, and I feel so bad for Cleveland because, honestly, in my career, I mean, that's the place I identify with the most because it's, it's where I was the longest and where really I learned football. Like I believe I know it right now, and to see them now, they're they're a very talented football team that now is becoming again one of those, you know, one of those franchises where you just sitting there going, yeah, that's the Browns. But are they going to be sellers, like? I don't know what you, what can you do, Miles Garrett? Would you? You mean sellers as far as like selling off some of pieces? The pieces that yeah, have? yeah. I mean nobody's going to take Deshaun. Right. Um. I. I don't. I don't think so. I. I don't think that's what you would want to do. I. I really do think you could probably like you saw what Joe Flacco did with this football team a year ago. You. You literally right now, I believe, give themselves a chance to pull out of this downward spiral that they're in. Need to replace one guy. You probably need to sit one guy down. Yeah, but they chose not to bring Joe back because they didn't want a quarterback controversy. Exactly. And and they bring in Jameis for the same amount of money that Joe is making in Indianapolis. That See, to that, me is embarrassing. That you're right. It is. What, what what I'm saying is, you don't need to be sellers. All you need to do is really move one guy out of the way. Move him over here, set him right next to Kevin Stefanski on the sideline, and you may see this whole football team turn around in terms of the way in which they play. But so that no, they don't need to break everything up. They just need to make one change. But to make that one change would be commit admitting to the most colossal like mistake in the history of the NFL when it comes to contracts. (laughs) And I don't know. Is ownership willing to do that at this point? If they don't. Then this it's just going to get worse. 